Thanks for joining us. This week, who's winning, who's losing, as the government slams the emissions trading scheme into deep freeze? And is the super city mothership turning into a smothership? Well, the government's decided to hit the brakes on the next phase of the emissions trading scheme. The international economy is looking too shaky, the rest of the world is moving too slowly, and pushing on with the next phase of our scheme was going to get too tough on our businesses and consumers. So the government's decided that the New Zealand businesses required to buy carbon credits for their emissions won't be losing that two-for-one concession deal that was going to be phased out this year. But there are going to be winners and losers as a result of this change. We're going to try and identify them now with OMF Finance Carbon and Energy Specialist, Daniel Crawford. Well, welcome, Daniel. Uh, there wasn't yeah. much warm-up to this last week. Was it uh, something the market was expecting? Well, the market was expecting the government to come up with some sort of announcement, uh, especially after the recommendations that uh, were made you know, a few months back. Uh, we these are the Kegel. These are the Kegel, Kegel recomm report recommendations. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Uh, there were some expectations that you know there might be some changes to the forestry, uh, the pre-1990, whether they get their second tranche or not. Um, I guess the market was a little bit relieved, or the foresters were relieved that you know, they did get their uh, the pre-1990 second tranche, and they also got uh, the ability to offset. Uh, on the emitters side, mm -hmm. uh, there was there was a little bit of an expectation that there would be some changes to the at the ETS, uh, which didn't actually come didn't occur. So that was a bit of a surprise to the market. Yes, because in fact. I think it, the Kegel recommendation was to proceed. Absolutely. Yeah, and so here we are, deep freeze. What, deep change, what, what changed the government's mind? Well, we're in a, a current environment uh, globally where economies are slow, uh, growth is slow. Mm -hmm. uh, government looks at the cost of carbon and into the economy and they don't want to see a great increase. Uh, we want to remain competitive on a global sort of uh, level. And so, uh, I get, from that perspective, they, they preferred to you know, keep yeah. things as is. So effectively, the, the two-for-one concession that the emitters uh, yeah. had was due to be phased out. It's not going to be phased out now. Yes. Um, does that mean that some of them are going to be uh, um, overstocked with carbon units because they've been buying up an expectation uh, that they would have that concession go? Yes, I would say that there are a few emitters within the New Zealand ETS who have been uh, purchasing based on the risk. They have to take, the, take that into consideration as a risk going in the future. Uh, so right now, there will be a bit of an oversupply situation or too many units in the registry. Okay, account. I mean, are you seeing that in the market? Are people selling down? There hasn't been a mass exodus of NZUs by emitters. What I am seeing, or what I've observed recently, is emitters uh, taking their oversupply or the, the, the ex excess units in their registry and rolling them out into forward contracts. And those forward contracts could be for more NZUs or international units. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because uh, it seems to me that actually the international units are slightly cheaper than New Zealand units. Why is that? They are. They are cheaper. And that's, uh, there's two major issues here. The, the, obviously, the European uh, sovereign debt problems that we're, you know we've been observing in the last six months to a year uh, that that has really depressed the price of carbon. I mean, if you you look at a, the uh, one one carbon unit and say what does that represent? Well, to me, that represents growth. Mm -hmm. Right, a growing economy means more emissions. I mean, it doesn't represent six dollars and eighteen cents. No, I don't think so. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you pay for them. That's what you pay for them. That's the cost okay. of it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So with the with the decrease of in growth in Europe, you know, there's a decrease in demand, and so you know, with with less demand, the price falls. Okay, but why was there this margin for the New Zealand units? Why were we paying slightly more than they were in Europe? Well, at these in fact, we've been paying considerably more than we that. have been paying considerably more. Uh, the reason being is uh, there's just no supply in the New Zealand market. If the forester, the foresters are the main source of supply in New Zealand, and uh, with with when they incur with the, when a forester sells an NZU, they incur a liability. Mm -hmm. Correct. So um, at six dollars fifty. It just doesn't make sense to sell that unit mm -hmm. when, you're, when your liability is $25. Uh, given that, there's just no, no room to move. So uh, no sellers, price doesn't move down.
Okay, so it's, it's sort of going to sit there. Equally, that makes a bit of a nonsense about the cap at $25 per unit, doesn't it? Absolutely. I think the, <laughs> the highest the market ever traded at its peak was about $21. Okay. Uh, and, and how long ago was that? That was uh, about uh, 18, 18 to 20 months ago. We, we we have a situation, however, where one of the suggestions that was floating around was that the government should actually be requiring New Zealand emitters to buy a certain proportion mm. of their carbon offset in New Zealand units rather than international mm. units. What's your view on that? What would that have done if the government had adopted that idea? Domestically, that would have a positive impact on the market. We'd start to see a bit more demand, a little bit more growth and an and, uh, and increase in transactions. Uh, the problem with the, the, that is that there is no supply to meet that demand. Uh, so the government would have to step in and create a facility to either supply units directly, either th through an auctioning facility, that's been discussed quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but how do, how do you evaluate how many units to sell? And I think that's, uh, that's the problem the government has really grappled with and, and uh, put it in the too hard basket. So they've just mm -hmm. said, no, we'll just leave things as is and we'll use our... Okay, so the gov if the government hadn't actually frozen the scheme, mm. what impact would it have had on the New Zealand emitters and, cons and consumers for that matter? Right. So if we'd, if we'd gone for uh, the two for one to 100% of mm -hmm. our liabilities, removed the cap or phased the cap out, obviously demand will have increased. Uh, assuming that the, everything stayed the same as it was and we didn't restrict the number of units or international units that could be used, mm. price wouldn't actually move that much. You think that the, the amount of supply of global units is, is significant. Uh, to the tune of 1.2 billion units. Our, our annual demand is about 15 million units. Yes, but the liability of the emitters would have gone up 100%. Wouldn't so we went from 15 so, to 30 know, million. And, and they would yeah. be looking to pass that cost on. So that would they come would. at you and your power bill, your, your it presumably would. your, it your would. The consumer, bill. The consumer would have been uh, pinged at the, pump, at the pump or at the power point. Okay. So let, let's... Um, look at one other issue which has mm. changed and that's Australia moving into its um, its uh, carbon regime, yes. its yes. new regime, yes. a carbon tax, not, not a, an ETS but moving to an ETS at mm. some time in the future. Yes. Do we know enough about what the Australian thinking is mm. to see with confidence that we could have a harmonised ETS mm. scheme across Australia and New Zealand? For mine, David, I think there's a lot of water to go under the bridge there. Um, and, and while the government, I think, is watching the Australians very closely, uh, it is very hard to say you know, what's going to happen in the future there. Uh, we believe that the Australi Australians will keep the price on carbon. It's too difficult to, uh, to remove that now. Uh, but you know, what the ultimate form of that is, you know, so Abbott, Abbott may have his way and change the system okay, in so some we, way. We essentially uh, there's an election to come in Australia where this will be a critical issue. But, Absolutely. But you just said you didn't think Abbott would actually take a carbon tax off. No. Well, the I mean, he's, that's what he's saying. Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Excuse my... Uh, no, that's uh, right. You know, I don't understand Australian politics 100%, but, you know, they've got their, their mm. two different uh, forms of government, right? The yep, state and federal, yep. And so, uh, so there are, yeah, there are distinctions. So. Absolutely, and the Greens have got control of the upper house at the yes. moment. The Greens are going to, oh. the Greens are going to upper and lower house. Upper yes. and lower house. That's right. So they they're going to uh, prevent Abbott from dissolving it, or dissol mm. dissolving that, dissolving it. Yep. Okay. Um, so essentially, it's going to be politically too hard for him as well, with, with with Senate stacked the way it is. Absolutely. It'd be politically too hard. Abbott would have to go for a double dissolution effectively. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. believe that's only happened a couple of times in history and it's a very risky political Is game. Is he as committed longer term to moving to an emissions trading scheme or is he just saying, okay, well I don't really want to do anything, quite frankly, <laughs> except to take it out? I think he will, uh, well, it's, it's very hard to say. He, mm -hmm. does, he wants to take it out. Uh, Probably the easiest route for them would be to dissolve, not to dissolve it, to uh, 
to water it down in effect mm -hmm. and uh, reduce that cost to the public. Okay. It's very difficult for them to uh, back out of what they've already done. They've, you know, they've given the, the public their cash subsidy so and uh, they'll be unscrambling an egg effectively. So essentially, um, we aren't going to be hanging our hats too much on what happens in Australia as we move forward. Very much a uh, wait and see scenario. You know, we, yeah. But we're coming to a, another review point in 2015 when agriculture will be reviewed mm. to see whether or not there's enough progress. Mm. Could you, can you see circumstances emerging between now and then that would enable the government to bring agriculture into the scheme mm. fully? I mean, they're partway there now. It's biological emissions that mm. are not covered. Mm. But could you see enough happening that the government could actually bring agriculture fully into the scheme by 2015? Well, given we're quite far ahead of the curve as far as a nation with a federal ETS, uh, with a lot of nations playing catch up, you know, uh, Australia, Canada, uh, China with its seven you know, regional ETSs they're bringing in, if we were to see the, that rise in the, those regional ETSs and, and see a, a general catch up with us, and p potentially somebody stepping ahead of us, then mm -hmm. it might be likely that we, you know, possibly we could bring in agriculture. It's our biggest income earner as a nation, yeah. and uh, always the government's going to be wary of imposing, you know, unnecessary costs. I mean, I do hear that this is not an area where the government wants to lead in. No, uh, doesn't want to be a wor world leader on it. Equally, it doesn't want to move when technically there are no reasonable means by which they mm. could actually reduce the emissions from livestock at this Absolutely. point. Absolutely. What's so, the point you know, of uh, taxing, or, you know, is it, is it carbon? <laughs> well, it's You're another fart to, tax. It's just a fart tax, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the whole idea is to reduce emissions, and if there is no feasible way to reduce the emissions, then, you know, it's so unnecessary. So, looking, looking at, uh, at the future, mm. is it likely that we will simply pick up the scheme from where we're leaving off now and continue on plan, on track with the existing policy when we do come to that next review point in 2015? At some stage we will certainly you know, pick up and, and look to continue pushing forward and, and uh, you know, bring the, the scheme to its full effect. Uh, we're going to need to see the world growth pick up. We're going to need to see a region, you know, the, the whole uh, global carbon price build and develop. Um, and we also, we also have to go through an election before 2015. And we also have to go through an election, with, that's with right. With two parties which are quite uh, radically different in their approaches to ETS. Indeed, uh, indeed. I mean, sure, they both agree that there should be some, but they don't, some agree, they, they don't agree on things like agriculture. For no, they don't. And they've, 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 Labor would certainly have agriculture in as uh, soon as possible. Yeah. Um, no? So yes. that in itself would suggest there's going to be some continuing uncertainties for everyone right I believe through we, this absolutely. whole period to 2015, 2015 and beyond maybe. And beyond. Carbon is, uh, is a political market by nature. It, uh, and when politics are involved, uncertainty and, and, uh, is, going to, you know, is going to rule the day, unfortunately. However, they, they, the New Zealand government has, you know, has uh, ensured us that ETS, ETS is here to stay and uh, very confident about the future. They, they are observing the global growth of, of uh, carbon markets and, um, and the desire to create price on carbon and, and reduce emissions and moving to a, a low carbon growth scenario globally. So uh, ultimately we will move forward, yeah. Daniel Crawford, thank you very much. Thank you. Carbon and Energy Specialist at OMF Finance, Daniel Crawford. And coming up, Super City Auckland, Mothership or Smothership? Stay with the Beats and Interview.